Betsy, welcome to the Organized 365 podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. You said before we started recording that you've been listening to the podcast for 10 years, which is how old the podcast is. So yeah, it's a I, long time. I know it is. I am trying to, I don't even, I wish I had some sort of documentation of when I started. Um, but I mean, you didn't have very many podcasts on there. And like I said, you were in your car talking to your tree um, yes. and uh, just talking to yourself. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I still remember this. So let's see, we would have been 2014. So did I start the mm -hmm. podcast when Joey was in? I, I know I, a lot of the podcast got recorded when he was going to Baden, which was a Catholic uh, school. that's like 30 minutes away from our house, 20, 30 minutes. So by the time you drive out there mm -hmm. or I would get there early to beat traffic, then I would just park. There's a little golf course next to the school. So I would just park in this tiny little parking lot and I would be staring at the tree because if I- yeah. Back my car another way that I look because sometimes people are like, What is she doing? Not very often. Very many people in this parking lot. But sometimes I was in like, you know, the Culver's parking lot. You got to do what you've got to do. And also, right. I'm glad that I said that. Number yeah. one, because it's so easy to record a podcast. It's not easy to be consistent, but it's easy to record one. And a lot of times we create these invisible barriers to our success because we think, Well, I don't know where a podcast studio is. I still don't yeah. have a podcast studio. I mean, you yeah. don't need a podcast studio. Yeah. Yeah. And that mind. was, that was very inspiring to me. Um, and because I was listening to you for organizing, but then you were saying all of those things. And I was like, huh. yeah. And I was like, maybe I could start my own business, other business. I already had a business, but maybe I could do something like that. Maybe I could coach people. Maybe I could. And now I actually have a coaching business. Um, so I think, you know, kind of, you were one of those people that was in my ear, like, huh, that's really cool that she's doing that. And she's just talking about what she's passionate about and getting the word out and, you know, that, and doing it in a way that did seem very accessible, which I appreciated. So. Well, congratulations. That's so <laughs> cool. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah. And yes, I, I think when I first started the podcast, well, first of all, I didn't do YouTube because I knew I wouldn't be that polished and professional. I just couldn't even get, I couldn't even figure out how to get the camera going. I, I ended yeah. up buying a camera, but I still have never, I don't know how to vlog. I'm not a vlogger. Um, <laughs> but I do think that when you are transparent about the transformation you're going through, it resonates with almost everyone. For when sure. you get it to a perfect polished feel, people are like, well, that's nice to watch. It's entertaining, but yeah. it's not, um, it's not like people could come along on the journey with you. So right, <laughs> don't right. Really think of that level yet. Yeah. And I also just, I mean, I've been watching, listening to you since, I mean, I've watched your journey too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like you had Pat, I think that's it. Um, yes. And then I, you, the Sunday basket was just, you had, you didn't have the podcast for that yet. You right. didn't have the product for that yet. I think it was right. an ebook or something. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about it. And then I watched you go through that whole journey of like, I, I think I want to make a product. <laughs> you know, and how did you do that? And you shared, you just, you shared it all. Right. And you went along mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and watch And so I've watched Organize 365 go through where it was just a podcast and, you know, you had a few things, you had like an Etsy, not an Etsy store. Was it an Etsy yes. store? It yeah. It was an Etsy, Etsy store. store. Yes. Exactly. So it was like, you know, and then watching it progress to where it is today and you have all these different things and, you know, so it's just, and you're an idea person. I'm an idea person too. All the ideas, all the ideas, all the ideas. Yes. Um, so, um, and I get overwhelmed by my ideas. So watching you kind of go through that and see how you have been able to actually make progress on things and do things and take them out of your head and actually make them into physical things. And, um, it's, it's just been a really fun and very inspiring to me. Well, thank you. And <laughs> I wasn't I follow, expecting to follow, talk about that part, but it's true. I, <laughs> I follow a couple of other female entrepreneurs where they were like unknown and now they're known. And like, I, when I'm watching them now today, I remember, you know, back three years ago, five years, seven years ago where they were. And I will sometimes when I go to bed and I'd be like, okay, this is where she is today. But remember, this is where she was three years ago, six years ago, nine mm -hmm. years ago. And I'm like, oh yeah, right. I met her nine years ago yeah. in this instance. And now they're here. And like, I do watch that progression too. And I think that um, podcasts are a really great way to do that. Or like if you follow somebody every day on like a social media platform, mm -hmm. which I do a handful of people. And when you watch 
for me, when I watch a female's transformation, it's so multidimensional. Mm-hmm. It's not just the growth of the business. Like mm-hmm. I can follow male podcasters or real read books, male books or whatever. It's very tactical and how to do it. Mm-hmm. And I obviously have had to do those things too. But when you watch a female, you see how it blends with their nucleus family, their extended family, their mm-hmm. friends, their relationships, how they spend their mm-hmm. free time. Like you're able to glean a lot more of that that I haven't been able to do with the male people that I have followed. Interesting. There aren't that many females to follow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you're one of them now, so. <laughs> so speaking of household, who lives with you in your household? Um, uh, my husband and I have a 13, 13 year old daughter now. Um, and they were like three when I started listening to you, I think, um, something like that and two dogs and my daughter has a snake. <laughs> Boom. Hey, yeah. I'm not visiting. The snake. I'm not into the snakes. Don't worry about the snake. It just stays in its little hidey hole. You would never even know it exists. <laughs> okay. Move, <Yeah>. move on. <laughs> okay. So we know that you've been following for a long, long time. And yeah. you said that your daughter was around three when you yeah. probably started following Organized 365. What were you looking like? What interested you in finding it? Yeah. Like, a podcast at all 10 years ago, but a podcast right. about organizing. Right. I know that was like, you were probably one of the first podcasts I ever <laughs> listened to back then. Um, yeah. Well, I just, I love work. I've always loved organizing um, and I love to listen to organizing things to motivate me to clean the house and organize. And it's like, I don't want to do the dishes while listening to a fun organizing podcast. So um, listening to you just like help motivate me. It was more just about general motivation. It wasn't like, oh, I need to do this specific thing or, you know, I have to organize my whole house or something like that. It was more just this is always an ongoing thing that I'm working on and need motivation for. And so I love, and you love to talk, which is awesome. I love that your podcasts are often like an hour long because I hate the ones that are like, we're going to talk for five minutes and then have another intro and another outro. And I'm like, I got a lot of cleaning to do. Lisa, talk to me for like an hour. Thank you very much. <laughs> they're so, they're so long. Sometimes I'll do like half an hour ones. I'm like, okay, that's if you guys have just a little bit, but I'll like, I'll listen to a podcast. I don't care if I stop midway. Cause like, I always have a podcast going in my ear and I'll start the yeah. path. I'll do whatever. And then when Greg comes upstairs, he's like ready to watch TV. I just pause it. I don't care. Midstream. Yeah. I just yeah. do it again. Exactly. But the short ones are annoying because if you're trying to listen for a long Especially time, you have there's an intro, intro, outro, outro, intro, outro, outro, and you're like, Oh my gosh, I I can't even take this. So yeah, that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to listen to your, before I knew who you were anything, because you had nice long podcasts. I was like, good. I can like sink my teeth into this. She's going to be with me while I'm doing my stuff. Um, So that was good. (laughs) So since you started so long ago, did you ever watch Peter Walsh's show Clean Sweep? Um. No, and I don't know okay. I did it, although I'm very familiar with Peter Walsh favorite, and I've actually tried to look up some of his old things, but <laughs> it's, it was the most realistic, uh, mm-hmm. home organizing show. Cause you, he literally went into the house and they put like the tarp in the front yard and you had to move everything out onto the tarp and like, it yeah. was so real life organizing. I've never seen another show that wasn't orchestrated and highly produced. I just loved that show so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I would say that's probably the model I had in my head when I started the podcast, like I'm organizing my house that way. How would I talk to you while you're doing it? And like you, like I like to do things with people. So when I was, when my kids were two and six months old, when I created the Sunday basket initially, which would be 10 years before I started the podcast, um, I just would call and talk to my friends on the phone. And back then, 2000 and you know, we didn't even have cordless phones. So you got like, oh, I think I did have a cordless phone at that point, but like, I would just put it on my, on my arm and, you know, get that crook in my neck and like for an hour and a half yeah. cleaning while you're talking to a friend. Yeah, so that's yeah. how I just figure I got a headset it. so I could do that. Yeah. On demand. <laughs> Back text. in the day, I looked like I friends. literally, it was plugged in and it was a little headset and it had a microphone and it looked like I was a oh. telephone operator. And I was like thinking about that the other day. I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I did in like the nineties. <laughs> So I can walk around and clean. I wish I'd have thought of that. (laughs) But I think that we, especially as women, like we're very communal. Even if you're an introvert, you still like to like. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I'm clearly not. Um, (laughs) But I think when we're doing like mundane things around the house, like, especially when your kids are two and three, you're like, yes, it's a dinosaur. Okay. We can watch Ruby Uh, and Max, you know, like, but I I would like to think about something other than the same time. Right. Right. 
Right, right. And I also always love that you're always thinking deeper about things, right? So Mm -hmm. yeah, you would, and especially in the early days, you'd be like, here's how to organize a drawer. Here's how to organize a box. Like you were, were, it was tactical, but like pretty quickly you were talking about your philosophies and how you think about life and how you think about stages of life and how you think about, and I love that because I'm always like, I also am always kind of looking under the surface and looking for patterns and thinking about the larger picture and, um, I, I love all that stuff. So I was all about that. I've always been all about that too. It's just list thinking more deeply. And, and even the thing that motivated me to get on the podcast today was you were talking about how people use their houses and yes. I'm an interior designer. And I'm like, I think a lot about how people use their, yeah, I, I think a lot about how people use their houses. And you were talking about how people use their houses a hundred years ago or people who had staff and how do we use it today and how the house hasn't changed. And I'm like, okay, I think a lot about that. I work in Portland, Oregon. I work on a lot of houses. My house is 110 years old. Wow. No closets. No. Um, And uh, so I work on a lot of houses like that where my whole job is to think about how is this house made? Why? How do we use it today? How do we update it to how we use it today? How do people use their homes? How do we adapt them? Like I'm going in not just the organizing part, I'm going into the design part and we're reshaping spaces for how people use them today. So I was like, oh, I have to talk to Lisa about that. <laughs> okay, well, let's just go to that because now I'm like, well, I don't even care about the other questions I normally ask. I want to know that. So yeah, what what are, what have you been talking to me about that I haven't been hearing yet? <laughs> Well, I just, I mean, I don't know even know where to start, but I just think it's interesting, like, that, you know, just, just how the, like the progression of how houses were made. Okay. So for instance, where I live in Portland, we have a lot of old homes. None of the houses open up into the backyards. There's no access to the backyard. Side yard, maybe? Yeah. Well, there's like maybe a gar- yeah. uh, driveway and a door to the in directly into the kitchen from the side yard. Yes. That's like where the milkman would come in. Yes. The milkman would come up, he would put your, your milk in your house and, or there's these, like, um, what are they called? They're like an indoor outdoor. They were like the refrigerator, right? Where you you open up the door and he would put the milk in there and then you open it from the inside. But usually he just came right in the house and that's what that door is for. So yes, that, but there's no access to the backyard. And that's really like, now we're like, we want to be indoor outdoor and we entertain outside and da 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 and outdoor outs. Well, backyard was where you hung your laundry interesting oh my gosh I cannot wait to learn more in this podcast right the back the backyard is the utility space that's not a place to hang out in and Mm. to like enjoy and look at from the inside of the house that's where your laundry's hanging that's like utility space it's like letting somebody into your basement laundry area so we go into the house today and we're like why is there no access to the backyard there's not even any good windows onto the backyard and that's why so understanding like, well, that's the history and that's how people use the space. Like they were hanging, that's where their laundry line was. So now, okay, now I'm going into these homes and it's like, let's add some French doors. Let's add a deck. Yes. Let's, you know, like we want to open this up. Also just the, all the kitchens, they're not open to anything, right? Because the little woman was in the, that was like, she's in there doing her thing alone. Maybe well, there's a little table for the kids, but mm-hmm. And then right. voila, come out and here's the meal is just done, right? Like magic for the guests or for the family. And now we don't, obviously that's the biggest one. We don't live that way anymore. We all live in the kitchen. So everybody wants yes. the door, the wall removed between the kitchen and the dining room. So I'm the one who's going in and actually like, they're making those houses this way now, <laughs> but I go into those yes. old houses that weren't made that way. They're made for a different era. And it's like, well, why is the kitchen so closed off? It's like, because that's how, They lived. Everybody wasn't in the kitchen. There's no island. There's it's made for one person to like move around and be efficient with their space, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not how we use kitchens anymore. There's actual not from a hundred years ago, but Lillian Gilbreth, who did all of her uh, PhD research on efficiencies in the kitchen, and a lot of what we have in kitchens were developed by her in like I think it was the fifties. 40s, 50s, yeah. 60s was when she did those efficiency plans. So mm-hmm, that would have been mm-hmm. after the, the work triangle. <laughs> yes, the work triangle. And yeah. man, she developed some really cool things that they do not have in production today. I'm like, where's that baking station thing? Right, where's right. That, like, she had really cool things that uh, yeah. we're not used yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a really fun era. Like going into those mid-century modern homes is a really yeah. fun, like when they're still original kitchens, because they have stuff like that. 
Like they'll have these like super custom because people were just being really innovative and thinking yes. through like, we're going to scientifically think about how to blah, blah, blah. Right. So um, yeah, those are really fun when they're still there and they didn't get ripped out in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everything got ripped out in the eighties. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, Gold anyway. plated and put back in. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the other thing um, I, I think you specifically mentioned, I mean, that podcast was so interesting what you were saying about there were no hotels and, if anybody hasn't listened to that one, you got to go back and listen. What do you, I don't know if you know what it was really recent. It was just uh, a six oh one. Yeah, why are, why are <laughs> yeah, old houses so big? First, you know well, which you one wrote is. it in your notes. So I okay, <laughs> no, I never know what the podcast. You're like, it was never blah, blah, blah. Um, never. But um, yeah, that was a really interesting one. I thought, but um, so one of the things, and I think you said this because you're living in a house from the '80s, right? Yes, right. Yeah. So you still have the. Um, the poor little orphaned formal living room and the poor yes, little orphaned formal dining room. And they're really not building houses that way anymore. Like, and I've watched that progression too, um, where kind of in the nineties and the two thousands are like, well, we'll make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they're like, let's just get rid of it. And now that's just not even a thing anymore. Like it's really like homes are made with just pretty much the great room. And then there's usually like a, a den or a way area that's like for an office, for an office. or something. It's an office. But yeah, we pretty much lost the formal dining room and the formal living room in new homes. Um, now, as far I as actually I've seen, like mine. Like for a long time, it was wasted space, but I really well, do now like you have mine. your family coming over. Yes. So I do <laughs> like that we're eating dinner in the formal dining room because it's bigger. We would never do it in our kitchen. We yeah. still never sit in the front room, but at least it looks pretty. And I like that the TV is back in the family room because even after family dinner, like we'll start to clear the table and our grandson will go watch TV while everybody's still relaxing and eating dinner. And yeah. I'm in, you know, my fifties. So I've got a good decade where I am where Thanksgiving is going to happen and Christmas. Yeah. And so I kind of need that formal living room and yeah. dining room. But I was just thinking on the way into work today, I was like about that podcast episode. And I was like, how am I going to get all my household administration in one place? Like I have it in four different places. I'm like, can I get it down to two? Here's what I realized. I want it all on the first floor, but I use it all on the second floor. What is my mm. new? Why can't I just, <laughs> I have space on the second floor. Why can't I just call it a day and, and yeah, have it? But you're, you're, the queen of making, I don't know. you're the queen of making it work for how you actually live. So, so <laughs> I'm still noodling on it. It'll take me a while. Yeah. Maybe when I'm done with the PhD and I don't have all that school stuff there, I'll do it. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that brings me to, I was um, thinking about, I was like thinking about all that. I mean, it's so like literally 10 years of all the things that I've done because of listening to your podcast. It's almost, it's so interwoven into who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, that. I'm like we're really really good friends <laughs> I know we are Lisa um but I I am like how, how like even it's even hard to remember and go back like oh that was because of Lisa that was because of Lisa you know what I mean like to even remember yeah. like what were the things that I've actually been going back and listening to some more Wednesday podcasts again to like trick you know trick my memory of like oh yeah that was because of her that was because of her but one thing like was the use your space the way you use like make your space the way you yeah. use it, whatever, make it functional for how you actually use it, not like what it's supposed to be for. So, mm -hmm. um, and because I've been listening since my daughter was three, my spaces have changed, right. And how we function and how we've used them. And I think you gave me like the permission and the idea of like, oh yeah, well we're doing this now. So we're just going to like our dining room. I had a big armoire and I'm like, this is where we do crafts. So I took all the China out and it became a craft cabinet yes. for years because that's where my daughter, like that was the easiest place to have all of her stuff. We use a china once a year. So that went in a box in the basement, right? Because it's like, and then when we need it, we pull it out. And so it's that like, move the things out, like look around, what is taking yes. up prime real estate <laughs> that you never use? Move it into the storage area. You can pull it out when you need it. And then like really make, because that's the stuff that like, where do I put the crafts? They're everywhere. It's a mess. It's like, well, there's prime real estate right there. Get rid of the China. So I had that like that for years. Now she's older, doesn't have the craft stuff going on. I moved that to the basement. Like I got rid of most of it, but then the stuff that we wanted to keep, I have that in the basement because we don't use it as much. Right. So that goes down yes. to the cold storage. And I, now I work from home. I used to have an office outside of the house. Now I work from home and I, I just like to work in the dining room. I could, yes. I, I could work. I have other places I could work, but I'm like, I just like to perch in the dining room. So that arm, that cabinet is, is now all my office stuff. 
I love it. So it's like, and that works really, really well. So it's like it's just transitioning through whatever phase of life you're in. You're in the phase of life where your kids are doing crafts, make your dining room their craft area. You're yes. in the phase of life where now they're doing homework, make it the homework area. You're working from home, make it the office, right? And so, and it's, I love that it's all in there. So when we want to use the dining room for a holiday meal or a family meal, it's like, it just all goes in the cabinet. It's the dining room again. Um, yes. So it's not like permanently, you know, office-y looking or something, but- yeah. So that, that has worked really, really well. And I just recently got a nice dining room table, our first one that's not hand me down, but I was looking. And if I wasn't in my season of life, I would really seriously look at those tables they have. They look like side tables, but then they like expand out to really mm-hmm. long yeah, like, they're uh, giant. dining room tables. Mm-hmm. And then they go back to side tables again. Um, They're not cheap. I think it's like a thousand dollars, but it would be worth it because then literally your dining room could be a dining room twice a year and yeah. the other 363 days of the year could be whatever you want um, Exactly, because you need that bigger table. Like even now we're going to have Thanksgiving and we aren't going to fit at this. I got this beautiful table and we're not all going to fit. I'm still going to have to add a card table to it. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> well, you can't never. Yeah, I know. I mean, if you built it for that, yeah. Like I, yeah. I had a client who moved from a small house into a house that had four floors and I mean, it had so many bedrooms because she had a huge extended family that all come to visit. And I'm like, are you so happy? Everybody can stay with you now. And she's like, no, they can't, they can't all stay here. Like it still wasn't big enough for everybody. No. I was like, yeah, I guess you'd have to have like 12 bedrooms, wouldn't you? Like even with the huge house right. she had, it still wasn't big enough for everybody. She's like, oh, well. <laughs> I think we buy houses and we decorate houses for when our extended family come over, but we live in houses almost every single day. Not that way. Yeah. So how can you make it both? Like how can you make it function the way that you want it to function most days? And then the one, two or three times when you have that bigger extended family over, it can morph into that space. And trust me, nobody's looking at what's underneath the tablecloth anyway. You could just have a regular, you know, $30 fold up table. Nobody cares. They just care if you made a good turkey or not. And you'll hear about the turkey for decades. You (laughs) never hear about the table they sat at. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's where your house really starts to actually function well for you is when you look at it as how can I make this space work for how I actually live? Not this like, oh, that's the dining room. So that needs to be used for dining. And that's the, right. Um, actually looking at how can I adapt it? And believe me over all the years, this house has worked. I've slept. I mean, this house has, has morphed and worked in so many different ways because it's a teeny tiny little bungalow built in 1909. It has one bedroom. Oh, wow. And yes. Um, and um, so I, like when my daughter was born, we put her in the bedroom, we slept in the dining room and put up a curtain. Um, it. and then, you know, and when I first moved in, we were sleeping in the base, semi finished basement. So there's two bedrooms down there that are like, in, but they're the basement. They're sort of finished, but you know, we slept down there and I had my office in the bedroom. We slept in, even though there's only one was only one bedroom in this house, we've slept in like six different areas. <laughs> I'm like, we'll sleep in the attic. We'll sleep here. We'll sleep there. Um, and it's like, I never had my closet with my clothes in it in the room, you know, and it's so ironic. I'm an interior designer and I'm creating these really functional spaces for other people. But um, meanwhile, I was like trying to make everything work for my house, but I've, I've had to get really creative. Like, how do I make it work for me? How do I make it work for me? How do I adapt it for this phase of life? How do I adapt it here? Um, and I'm happy to report we did remodel and we finished our attic into a master suite. So we have a bedroom oh, up there for us and a bathroom oh, and actual closet. I know actual closet. So thank God we did that before the pandemic. <laughs> so we were able to have that space. Um, but that's all been like a progression, you know? Um, and I don't think it's unrelated that I have the capacity to, cause I did all the designs and the plans for that. Yeah that I had the capacity to do that because of getting more organized and having more ah, space in my week. Right. So it's kind of, it was kind of an overwhelming endeavor. <laughs> well, obviously you must love your home and your location to yes. continue to pivot and iterate and yes. not just find another home. I, I like this conversation because, you know, I, I watched some friends and family members move houses very often 
And I watched some that literally like us was like, okay, this is going to be our house. And like Greg and I have talked and even looked at houses of moving, but like, we're not going to, like we've been here 20 yeah. years. We're, yeah. we're, why move now? Um, and I mean, there are reasons we you could do a first floor mat. Like I could justify moving if I wanted to, but I haven't. And I think often we think that the next house is going to be better. And for me, like the house that we have doesn't flood. I think it would almost be impossible for it to flood the way it is, the way it mm -hmm. sits on the land and where it sits, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, when if you've ha had a flood, like it's horrific. Like we don't yeah. have a sump yeah. pump because we wouldn't, it, we just don't even have one because you wouldn't mm -hmm. need one. So that's something I don't have to worry about. Like we have a walkout mm -hmm. basement. So we were able to turn that into Abby's, you know, mm -hmm. apartment. It's a legit apartment. Like she can get out down there if anything were to happen. She's not in a basement where she couldn't get out if there was a fire or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are problems in our house, but we know what the problems are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we know where the floor is on level. We know that, oh yeah, eventually that thing is going to be need to be replaced. If you buy a new house, you don't know the history. So then it's like playing whack-a-mole with these things you didn't know about. There is no perfect house. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I um, mean, and my career is helping people make the house they live in what they want it to be. Like that's what I do for a living, you know? And so, price out moving, like just packing yeah. it and moving it. How much is that? Like and take that and just put it into remodeling. Could you get done the couple of things that are really uh, yeah. driving you crazy? Also, you probably have to do those anyway to sell the house. Right. So you're going to have to right. do no matter what. Yeah. Um, so we're actually, we redid the kitchen when my father passed away and we got a small inheritance and I always wanted to redo our kitchen. And so Greg has been saying the last couple of years, you know, kitchen saver, like they'll like come in and just reface your kitchen, mm -hmm. like the doors and stuff. And I'm like, no, we are like, we checked that off. We redid our house. Like in my family, everybody, like, if you stay in your house for a lifetime, you redo the kitchen one time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, do it again. I'm like, do the kitchen two times. Like, I don't have a reason <laughs> for this. And yet I've had friends that have moved like five times as in they got right. five new kitchens. And I'm like, well, I guess if you live somewhere 30 years, so we actually have people coming over and giving us estimates. And I'm like, oh, I never thought about not redoing the entire kitchen because we like the layout, just refacing just it. Yeah, update and a little bit. Also, I want nine feet of drawers like I gave Abby in the basement. Like when I made her kitchen, it's all drawers. So I'm like, I would like this to be all drawers and I would like it all refaced. And I like need part of this wall cut down so I can open my refrigerator. refrigerator. Yes. <laughs> I that story. Not open this silly <laughs> refrigerator. Um, and I'm putting up a second chandelier in my dining room because the way that the table is bigger than the dining room. So there's a chandelier in the middle that's like over Greg's head. And then I'm like way down here in the dark. Yeah. I'm putting, it's going to look ridiculous if you look up, but if you're sitting at the table, it's going to be great. And you know what? I don't care. We could take it down, you know, 90 years from now when somebody sells our house, we're never moving. So it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter what the resale value would be. I'm tired of eating in the dark when I like the light and Greg's eating in the light. And he'd rather it be darker. So anyway, <laughs> And uh, to do all of that will we'll not cost as much as moving. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's why I have a job. <laughs> yeah. So what other things have you done that have been creative or like, can you think of any clients where you're like, okay, they literally were going to move, but we did these couple of things and then they didn't. Oh, that's a good question. Um, Sorry on the spot like that. Well, I mean, yeah, I know. I'm like trying to think of. Ah, uh, I mean, I mean, that's kind of like every job, right? That's kind of <laughs> what every job is that I've done is like this house isn't working for us. So, I mean, a lot of opening up the kitchen to the dining room. Um, like I've done a lot of additions where like a lot of these old houses don't have um, even a second bathroom. You know, they might have one bathroom in a whole house. Um, so it's like, okay, we're going to add on and add an actual mm -hmm. primary suite with a bathroom on it. Um, yes. things like that. Um, yeah. And I wish I'm trying to think of like, oh, this is the, you know, but I mean, it's kind of every house has been where what is we, this the... house doesn't work. So we need to remodel because it's a big investment. The stuff that we do, like yeah, we're say, like, adding on the... and you know, all that. What's the ballpark of like from low end to high end of what you've seen with different renovations for a cost? Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, Lisa. <laughs> I mean, especially I since know. the pandemic, when I started, you could maybe do a really simple kitchen for 50 and now they're all like a hundred, 200,000 just for a kitchen. Holy cow. Yeah. And my kitchen was 35,000 when we did it, 35,000. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. 20, 2009. Now, ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. so 2008, the world fell apart. Yeah. So there were great deals Remember. everywhere on everything I got. I bought every all the cabinets from Lowe's. We did not replace the floor or the ceiling. We did take out the softening, so I got bigger cabinets. We did take out the um, built-in pantry. I, uh -huh. I can't remember if I got new appliances or not. I'm, I might have. And we had like a local guy do it. So it wasn't like yeah. a firm. Yeah. Now, and that was the time because everybody was desperate for work. So you got really good prices. Yeah. So then we did a deck in 2020. And I want to say that was 20,000. And we did that with the money we were going to take to Italy. And then oh, the wow. next year, 2021, we did our master bath. And we used one of those prefab places where they come in and they do it like in a week. And that was 35,000. Yeah. 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 Which is uh, but, seems low to me. Yeah. Seems very low to you me. You all were following. So that was, you know, that was a good it. deal. <laughs> oh, really? They put the really? tub in the wrong place. You guys told me to tell them to move. Oh, no. <laughs> and actually, they did come in uh, six months ago and completely redo the floor because they had done it wrong. And oh. it was coming apart. And they did make good on that deal. So that was good. And then uh, we redid the shower downstairs for Abby in the basement. That was 9000 And that was one of those. They do it in one day. And so then over at Joey's condo, he needed a new shower, also 9000 So if you're going to like, if you just want a new shower, just a new shower, people, <laughs> 9000 And it's, cons I mean, I got all, I'm in Ohio, but I got all the quotes. That's about what that costs. And now I'll find out what this kitchen saver is going to be. We're going to do kitchen saver and then the same company that did Abby's uh, basement is quoting it. I have no, I, I have no idea what it's going to be. Yeah. I love I the idea of not getting rid of all the cabinets. So why do they, they don't need to go to the landfill. They do just. Oh yeah. Cabinets. No, I mean, yeah. yeah. Stay, save They're yourself good, a lot yeah. of trouble and all of that. But um, yeah. yeah. And also keep in mind, like when somebody brings me in um, as a professional interior designer, who's going to be helping them with the interior architecture of their home, it's going to be a higher, higher, more custom, yeah. you know, like, so I don't see the prices of the, okay, I'm going to DIY and I'm going to, you know, sub it out myself and, and do these things. So my prices that I'm seeing are going to be like just a different. And you're in Portland. And I'm, I'm in Portland. In Cincinnati. I'm in <laughs> Portland. Yeah, it, it is. is. But things have like doubled since the pandemic. I mean, and, and it's, they have. Oh, I find it very discouraging, honestly, because I'm starting to feel like, wow, only the elite can actually remodel their homes. And that is discouraging to me. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I I mean, yes, in your area, but, but I throw those numbers out there because like we moved into our house in 2000, uh, 1996, we paid $165,000 for our house. Now it's worth like 400 or something. So We've never moved, but if we moved, I can guarantee you we'd buy a house that's worth more than 400 because like I didn't work then. Like we have different, we would buy a yeah. much bigger house than we have now just because of, you know, the money that we earn, but because we don't and we're not, and we're remodeling. Yeah. We, we put a lot of money in this house in the last right. four years. However, we're going to live here another 30 probably. Right. And you, it's yeah. like not even, we haven't even hit the amount that it would cost for us to literally sell our house and move just in fees and moving. Right. And so I do the math that way and I'm like, okay, fine. Refin refinish the kitchen. Like, and we can enjoy it. And I could put my house on the market tomorrow. I wouldn't have to do any, I, I'm ready. To, I'm always ready to list my house if I needed to, because yeah. I want to enjoy it. Yeah. Done. Yeah. I couldn't do that when the kids were younger though. We didn't have the money or the time, but yeah. But now yeah. I'm like, okay, well, if we want to do it, then do it sooner rather than later and enjoy it. And also there are some good handymen that are local. It takes a while to find them, but when you find yeah. them, uh, it takes longer to get the job done, but they're, they're really good. Yeah. Yeah. It's finding those people find. is gold. Yeah. Finding those people really is, is the key. Yeah, exactly. My husband was a contractor, so that has been helpful. <laughs> yes. So I was talking to my husband about this the other day and I, we were talking about the whole housing thing because we don't have enough houses in the United States. We have a housing shortage. We have for a long time and 2008 hurt the housing industry, but a lot of people who were in construction went to different jobs mm. and the supply chain for what we need to build houses also was altered in 2008. So we're actually dealing with things from 2008, not from the pandemic. The pandemic just mm. accelerated those things, but mm -hmm. this is actually a 2008 problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And I've watched that whole progression because I was doing, you know, I had my design business in 2008 and watched that whole 
plane crash <laughs> happened, but made it through. Um, and then, and then the pandemic was interesting because I was like, well, maybe there won't be interior designers anymore for, you know, like it was like, what's happening. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, we're busier than ever because everybody's stuck in their homes and they're looking around and they're like, I can't stand this anymore. I need to make this work for me. I had that travel money I was going to use for Italy and I'm going to use yep. it for my remodel instead. Exactly. Yep. So, um, so that was actually, and, and that was actually a really good time of let's make this house for how we use it, you know? Yep. Um, and I want to create a home office. I want to, you know, so it, it was like people were really nesting and thinking about their spaces differently. Another thing that happened in there, which was interesting is we're like, let's open it all up and have all the spaces open. And in the pandemic, people are like, let's close it off. Because <laughs> we're all on our separate <laughs> Zoom call. Over there. The kids need to be in a, you know, a room with the door so they can have school. And I, I need to be on my Zoom call. My husband needs to be on his Zoom call. So we actually need some doors in this house. <laughs> we need some and staff. And offices. Privacy. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause our lease is going to be up. We're looking for new offices. There are a lot with open spaces. And I'm like, well, I guess we could do cubicles. I'm like, no, we can't. Even though we're an in-person company, we still have remote team members. And sometimes we're all on zoom meetings, like just cause it's more convenient. If you have one remote than everybody, even we're all yeah. in the office, we're all on zoom. No, everybody needs their own office so they can all be on their own zoom. Cause yeah. we all shut our doors when we're in a zoom. I was like, okay, I need a bunch of little offices. Whereas if you yeah. asked me two years ago, I would have said, I want more open spaces. Yeah. I it's think, changed um, everything. It's so interesting. I think when you think about, especially if you're a business owner that has a building or you're leasing a building and then in your own primary residence, whether you rent or uh, own, you're always going to have, well, hopefully you're always going to have a house, right? Um, you're always going to need to sleep somewhere. And so if you have the privilege and the opportunity of owning the place that you sleep, then you have a lot of opportunities for how you make that work for you. And mm -hmm. even if you are going to sell it three years from now, that's three years from now. Like if there's some modification that would work for you for a thousand days, and then you're going to retrofit it back, like, yeah, do it. you know, you could put up portable walls, like in buildings, they put up portable walls all the time. You could buy those and put those up in your house, like open up all of the options to how you make your house work for you and really get realistic. Like, are you going to stay there? Do you think you're going to stay there 10 years? Do you love your home? Like Betsy does then do whatever it takes in order to get it the way you love it. Now, yeah. you know, maybe you'll get a job and move a week from now, but that's okay. You know, really embrace where you are. And I think, yeah. you know, in good times, you want to have your house looking good because you want to have parties. And then as you know, we have so much inflation right now. I think it's hilarious where they're like, oh, inflation has abated. I'm like, really? Have you been? No. Have you been the inflation, lately? <laughs> the, the inflation at the supermarket, you realize they just feel is baked in now. Like the fact that you spend twice as much on groceries or more than you did is now the new normal as far as the government is concerned. They're not concerned about this anymore because it's not growing. It's permanently going to change how we provide food for our families for a decade. The inflation in the last 18 months will change how we provide food for a decade. And so if you take a couple of weekends to figure out how can you write this grocery bill, how can you get the nutrition and the wellness you want from which stores you want, how can you automate it? How can you streamline? How can you make your kitchen match that? It will literally pay you back money every single week and reduce your burden because nobody else is solving this problem for you. Like grocery stores aren't going to solve it. Government yeah. isn't going to solve it. Like this is the new normal. And so you were, that's the other thing. We're never going backwards. You remember in the pandemic, we were like, okay, when we get through this, we'll go back to 2019. Mm -mm. uh, when we no. get through inflation, we'll go back to 2021 pricing. No, no, we're never going back. We're always going forward. So yeah. And we're not get your house to go forward. Right. And we're not going back like um, in our homes either. Like I, I've noticed, yeah, some people went back to their office full time, but for the most part, most of us right. are still, we're either at home or at home part time. Like we realize, like, oh, we don't have to be in person for these meetings. We can do this. So people who always were traveling for the meeting or had to be in person right. or whatever, realize we don't have to. So uh, yeah, some people might've gone back full time like they were before, but that's, I feel like that's rare. Um, and we're so many of us are so much more working from home more. I feel like that home office has become a permanent thing for a lot of people where even if they're home two days a week or three days a week or whatever. Um, and we're doing so many more things just in a zoom call, for instance, I would have never had therapy over zoom before the pandemic. Now I have therapy over zoom. I need a door for that. 
<laughs> I know I'm going to be in my living room having my therapy in front of my whole family, right? So it's like even just a lot of the things that our doctor's appointments, our therapy appointments are just different things like that, that we're doing at home. So having, yeah, kind of having that space that when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about groceries, okay, I'm going to bring it back to Lisa stuff. Great. I'm going to bring it back to organized 365 stuff. So I was thinking about another thing that I was like, what is Lisa like baked into my, be, my persona? <laughs> I changed the way I do things. And one of the things that is the idea of um, like binders instead of loose paper or files. I used to have files. When I went through my paper, Lisa, you're like, fill a laundry basket. No joke. I put it in, in banker's boxes and I had a stack that went to the ceiling. Yeah, that's normal. That's normal. And and then more. Yeah. And that's the amount of paper I got rid of and to, like to get my binders and all of that going. But so the idea of having like checklists and all of that stuff that's out. And um, anyway, for the, for the groceries, I have just like, I have a list that I hand wrote that has all the normal groceries we buy and I photocopy it. So there's yes. a stack on the fridge. Yes. And it's like, this is what we normally have. So just check it off on the list instead of rewriting it every time. And it's like, keep it simple, keep it easy. I hand wrote it so that if I'm like, we no longer buy half these things, I'm going to redo yes. it. Um, even the, even the, I need to go to the, to the computer and rewrite my list is a, is like a, a step too far. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. I literally can just hand write this, right? Um, and just like make a bunch of copies. So that makes our groceries really simple. Um, and everybody can use it and like, just grab it off the fridge and take it to the grocery store or take a photo with your phone. That works the best for me. I know a lot of people like more digital solutions, but I'm a paper person. Do you have a copier um, at home? Yeah. My printer has, is like an all-in-one. Yes. So let's stop right here. Everybody's like, I don't have a printer. I don't have a copier. You guys, well, it's back to school right now. It's They're probably cheap. still Labor Day weekend by the time you're listening to this. Just watch for the sales. Like you can get yeah, a cheap. copier, printer, all in the one thing for like a hundred bucks. Yeah. I, I like the brother brand on sale for like a hundred dollars. First of all, the amount of ink in there is worth the hundred dollars. And then you just yeah. replace the ink. And you're not going to like get yourself yeah. an actual copier scanner thing. Once you have a copier in the house, I mean- it reduces so much roadblock. Just go make a copy of that. Just go make it like, it's yeah. so awesome to have a copy. They're of that. really inexpensive. And a printer. It's true. Yeah. 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 Just get one. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah. like you have an ice maker. You're not going yeah. and buying ice every time. So don't, yeah. I used to go to the copy store to make copies. Just get, just for the love, just start watching. Yeah. Wait till Black Friday. Get yourself. They're not expensive. They're awesome. Yeah. yeah. And my printer is in my basement. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's wirelessly connected, but I don't use it that often, you know? And so like maybe once a week or something or twice a week. So it's in the base. So it doesn't have to take up prime real estate either. You're like, I don't want this big thing, like taking up all this room or something like it doesn't have to live oh. in the middle of everything. Like I can walk over when I need it and get my steps in and get the stuff off the printer when I need it like twice a week. And I know some of you like colors. So I use the Brother Laser. It's like $99. That's the one that I use for black and white. I have two copiers at home. I know you're surprised. And then the <laughs> one that I use for a copier and also for color is Epson. Mm -hmm. And that one I like, our graphic designer told us about that because you can just put the ink bottles in it. Yes. You're not buying all the cards. It's like so cheap. No, like, honestly, that's, so that's a huge thing. That's if Epson. someone's going to buy a printer for sure, like because you'll spend less money on the printer but more on the ink and those and actually the um, inkjet ones that don't have the refillables they dry out yeah so, so do the refillable don't... ones for the color and yeah. then if you do a lot of black and white and print literature like me also get yourself a brother laser yeah so you and both, actually but if yeah. you don't need color which probably most of us don't need color most of the time the black and white is great because the laser will never it's a powder so it'll never dry out so even if you use your yes. printer like once right. a year exactly. it'll still work and the ink jets can dry out and then it's like oh I used it once a year but I have to change the ink every time which is a hassle or it dries in the little things so yeah the laser's when great the laser, if you're not using it that often when the laser stops 
though, when it's determined it's out of powder, it just shuts off and won't print anymore for you, which is a bummer. So then I'll put a new cartridge in and then all of a sudden brrr, it's like printing yeah. all this stuff that's been waiting to print for me. And you're like, oh, I forgot I sent that to the printer two months ago. Right? Exactly. <laughs> but that Epson, we can't do it with the brother, but with that Epson one, you can connect it to your phone. So like Greg and Abby will print from their phone to that one. Yeah. So anyways. Yeah, That's probably more than you wanted to know about a printers, side but, note, but it does make things easier. And if you yes. want to like have a lot of copies of your shopping list on the, yes. on the... <laughs> all these little, you think like, oh, we don't have a copier. Well, why don't you have a copier? Yeah. Like if it's stopping you from being productive in doing your role as a household manager, get a copier. You wouldn't yeah. say to your kids like, oh, I'm sorry, that calculator for that class in eighth grade is $114. So we're not going to buy you that calculator because you're only going to use it one year. You bought every single person in America. It's probably even more than that now. It was a $114 calculator eight years ago when we bought it and everybody has to buy it. But yet we don't buy a printer for our entire household that will last decades. Like it's Our thought process about how we spend money in our household is like, we'll have to do with nothing. But everyone yeah. around here can have gold plated everything. Like yeah. if the teacher yeah. says we need it, we need it. So I'm the teacher yeah. and I'm saying, get yourself a printer or two. Yeah. Yeah. Get them. The other thing that I used to be really um, frugal, unnecessarily frugal with was label, using my actual label maker to label things <laughs> because too. I was like, but the tape is so expensive and I don't want to waste it on this thing. And I was like, that's a, that's, that's what it's for. <laughs> so that's I bought, totally like, amazing. I went and bought a huge pack of things. So I always have extra and I just freaking label everything all the time, even if it's like, yeah. And I just, and I have it in a really handy spot because I use it all the time. So that does belong in the prime real estate. Um, and because I, I'm like, if it's easy to grab, I'll actually make the label. And even it's like, we're going camping and I have a jar of, I don't know, sugar in my camping gear. I'm like, just label it sugar because nobody knows what it is. Just put the label on it. You know what's the white powder you brought? I don't know. I don't know. It's a mystery. We'll Let never bring it on the camping trip. <laughs> because I know exactly. As you know, as you know from um, being an organizer, if it's not labeled, people don't use it and or they don't put it away. Like I have it sounds super idle, but the shelves on my fridge are labeled. The shelves yes, in my I pantry are labeled because it's like protein snacks go in this box you know, nuts yes. and seeds go in this box, you know, because people will put them away if there's a label. Otherwise it's like a mystery, who knows? Um, so um, I, I wanted to also mention another thing, um, make sure that we talked about is I have adrenal fatigue, Lisa. Um, okay. So, which means that I struggle with my energy a lot. So one place that we're, one way we're alike is we have a lot, both have a lot of ideas, but one way we're different is you're an energizer bunny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not. So I hear you're like, and you're like, and I did this. And I'm like, oh. I have to be very, um, I get overwhelmed really easily because I don't have a lot of energy. So I have to um, be really mindful of how I spend my time. And one thing like having the checklist, right? Oh my God, groceries. That's so overwhelming. I'm just going to go to bed. No, it isn't. There's a list, right? Um, so having like my binders with my laminated, like this is like home operations, like laminated checklists of everything, um, takes, helps me with my adrenal fatigue, helps me manage, um, helps me do things that I would probably feel too overwhelmed to do. Like helps me do fun things that I might be too overwhelmed to do. For instance, camping, like mentioned yes. camping, um, we, we kind of glamp a little bit. We like to be comfortable when we camp. And that can be really overwhelming to think of like all the things we need to bring camping. And I have um, in my sheet protectors, a list of everything that we bring camping. Each bag has a list. I use bags, not boxes, but like, so it'd be like, here's my kitchen box. Here's my whatever bedding box. And it's like, here's, so I have a, a sheet for each box and what goes in it. And then an overall list of all the things that need to go into the car, right? So there's the camping box, the kitchen box and the easy up and the tent, right? Whatever. Wow. I have 12 lists, which sounds really overwhelming, but what's more overwhelming than 12 lists is thinking of all those things. Yes, exactly. In my brain. I, I'm, I'm doing the same right? thing in my travel with Grayson's bag. With yeah. my, yes. I was like, okay, now that Grayson's bigger, I have to redo all of my Florida lists. And this year when we went to Florida, I said to Joey and Abby, I was like, do you want your packing list? And they both were like, yes. 
Yeah. So I pulled yeah. out the packing list from last yes. year. I took them up to my copier, made a copy, gave them to them. They packed yes. themselves. Yes. But and yeah, just remember. I love that. Otherwise. I love that. Oh my God. It's so overwhelming. And honestly, yeah. And, whatever. and honestly, for me, because I struggle <laughs> with my energy so much, it'd be like, do you want to go camping? And I'd be like, I no, no I can't even, right. I, I don't have the energy to do all of that. But if I'm like, pull out the list, just check off one, you know, just like, don't look at all of it. Don't even think of all of it. it. Allows me to focus, which is really good for my brain, and just be like, just go get that one thing, and then then the next thing, and just be able to do like one yes. thing at a time. And I know when I get through all of that, and they're all pre-packed and everything too, so it isn't as bad as it sounds. It's more like checking, like, did we run out of paper towels, and I need to pack more paper. or something, right? And I even have like my food list. Like, here's the things we normally pack for food, yep. like that we buy and put in the cooler. Yes, marshmallows. Like we normally put all of this Chocolate. in the cooler. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I'd be happy when I come see you at your <laughs> camping site and leave. A hundred percent. A hundred percent marshmallows and chocolate are on our list for sure. And crackers and I'm good. <laughs> but I yeah. think it's the, um, and thank you for sharing that because I think that I do have an unusual amount of energy and I've been able to increase the amount of energy I have, which is even more crazy. Um, but yeah. I think most people don't have the amount of energy I have. And there are also real diagnoses like yours where it it is an additional um, lack of energy that is created. But what you've described is you're still doing the same amount of energy. You just aren't doing as much cognitive load energy. Which yes. is what I am hoping to study. Yes. I will not do it for my dissertation. It's too big of a project. I'll never be done with my dissertation if we go into cognitive load theory for my dissertation. However... Uh -huh. Like the next 10 years of research, I want to do a series of studies that when you put them together, it'll be like, okay, like how do we me measure? Yeah. Cognitive load, just in grocery planning, cognitive load, just in bill pay. Because if you tried to do the whole organized 365 system, like you'd be in studies for forever, we'd never have results. But I do believe that it's the externalizing of executive function and then compartmentalizing like you would in cognitive load and then actually doing because a yes. lot of the mental work is taken away, not the yes. physical work. You still have to pack all the things and put them all in there. You just yep. don't have to think of all the things that need to go in all those places. Yeah. And that's, and that across the board with just about everything in my life, I've done that because, and that's the difference between, I just need to go. I can't even think about, it, I need to go lay down. Just even thinking about packing up for camping. I no, I need to go take a nap versus right. just. I have my list. I'm going to just go do, you know, like one thing at a time. I'm not, I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to think about what we're packing. I'm just literally like moving this thing to here. And it's been like that with so many things like, um, that have increased my quality of life majorly. Oh, like, great. like, um, during one of our planning days, when, when you first started planning days. So this is maybe, do, were you doing them in 2018? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking about like, what do we want to do? And I was like, you know, I really want to start having potlucks at our house. Um, well, there's a lot that needs to happen for that. Like the house has to be clean and you have to like get the food and you have to have all the stuff for everybody to eat like that. Again, I would have just wanted to go lay down and been like, no, I can't even think about that. But I got my, had my checklist for that. So, and even my list of the people that I normally invite and like, what are they bringing? Are they coming? And that was like laminated, not, you know, in my sheet protector on the fridge. So I could just yes. check it off and I didn't have to think about, oh my God, who are we going to invite and what are they bringing? And, you know, like it's just automatic. And we started doing that every month and oh, it was wow. like such a beautiful thing. And it, it was so easy. And people were like, I can't believe you do this every month. Like, this is crazy. I mean, we have like 50 people coming. <laughs> That's so fun. How fun it was so you? fun. So fun. And it was like no work because first of all, it was a potluck. So everybody's bringing stuff. But even for the stuff that we did, I was like, I have my little cabinet that has the stuff that like I went to Ikea and bought cheap plates and dishes and stuff. Right. Um, so I had and I'm like, okay, here's my when I do this stuff and here's what I buy. And so it all became really automated. So there was no no cognitive load to make that happen. Um, and there's so many things like that, that are like, oh, I'm having more fun in my life. <laughs> okay. So I love that you're saying this because I feel like a Debbie Downer sometimes, or like, I'm like the, um, you know, mean mom that says you can't reality check. <laughs> yes. Because I am very, I'm very, um, honest about how long it takes to get to this stage. She's not Im immediately. 
However, I truly believe that all of the fun things that you are doing and are a part of, someone had to do the planning for that. And you have just explained exactly that. If your family wants to go camping, it's 12 bags that have to be ready. Now, obviously, as they're getting bigger, they can, you know, help you with the bags if they wanted to, or you could delegate that. But it sounds like you like doing that. And, and my daughter has a, my daughter has a list, you know, like there's yes. your camping list, do it. And they, I don't have to worry about them at all. Yeah. I think we like doing the work of the fun if we don't have to recreate it every time. Yeah. So you're, yes. you're doing the camping. Yes. Same with the pot. Like, like you figured it out, you automated it, you made it productive and now it's in production and you yeah. do it like every yeah. month. It's yeah. just like a thing that you do. And people go, oh my gosh, how did you do that? Here's how you do that. First, you have to have the idea. Then you have to make all of the lists. Then you have to figure out if you can afford it. Then you have to do the supply chain of where you'll find all these things. Then you'll have to do the, the list of who the people are and all that. And then you have to invite them. And then you have to do the first one. And then you have to review everything and see what you would change the next time. And by the time you do it the third time, this is how we do it. And it just goes in the Sunday yeah. basket as a slash pocket or the folder as a thing. And you just pull that folder out and do it. But you right. don't get to, I just do potlucks every month without having done all of that work before. Yeah. And people well, think also, like, oh, you just always done it that way. Right, right. But keep in mind too. Okay. So two things that you said that I want to, I want to pinpoint. One is you said you have your list for camping and you must just like doing that. And I was like, no, the list, I, my husband now can do it. Oh, so he is doing it. Right. Because I have a list. If it was right. all in my brain, he couldn't do it. Exactly. And the other thing about it is all the lists are out and he'll just grab a list and go do it. He'll grab a list and go do it. He's in charge of packing up the car. So he takes the master list and I don't have to be like, did you pack this? Did you pack this? Did you pack this? Right. I just look at the list and he checked it off. So it means I can delegate and my daughter, I give her her list for camping or packing. Um, so I don't have to do it all. The list means I don't have to do it all. All of it. Yes. And then I wasn't the sure other... you'd gotten that far. Yeah. Oh, not believe every... me. And believe me. not everyone will. <laughs> so, you know, people will be like, how do you get the spouse to do it? You can't change other people. I don't know what to tell you. I'm glad that your husband. Yeah, no, he's, he's, but he's like ready and willing and wants to do it all. He loves camping too. So he's like, yes, all about it. But so what it means is our communication, it's like a communication tool for us where I can yes. just put it out and we, we don't even talk. He's like, we're just all like, he grabs a list. I grab a list. We're like, you're doing the cooler, I'm doing, you know, and then it's like, we don't, it's all getting checked off. And yeah. So that's one thing is it lets you share the work and delegate. So it's less work for you. The other thing is you said, okay, you have to think through this and think through this. Well, sort of, except also just make a list as you're doing it mm -hmm. anyway. So it isn't like another step. Okay. Just document what you're doing. Mm, like you would. So I didn't sit down and go, I need to make a list of that. I was like, who am I inviting to the potluck? And I just, as I was, instead of just doing texting them, I like to text and just keep it simple. So instead of texting them once and then like never thinking about it again, I'm like, I'm going to slow down and actually write a list of who I'm texting. <laughs> and when they text, you know, so, and instead of like, this was just my grocery list. I just made yeah. a copy of it. Right. Um, and so, and then, and then, I mean, the camping was definitely like, I had to sit down and go, okay, what's in each bag. And I did take the time to like write all those down, but it wasn't like, I would just did it as I was doing it the first time and the second time. And so it wasn't like this huge, like, oh, now I got to plan this whole process. It's like, no, just write down what you're already doing. Um, so then the next time it's easier, right? Yeah. And I think the other thing that you're doing, which is what we're doing in this podcast series right now, is you are being the CEO and the COO. And so then your team, your husband and your daughter can take on part of the workload because you've done yeah. the planning. Yeah. And I think a lot of the conversations right now in the male female divide and men aren't doing their fair share is that we want we want men to share in the cognitive load. And I'm here to say, I really don't. I really, I really want my household to run the way I want it to run. Like I'd like Greg to participate in the doing of the stuff, but I really want to be the decision maker. I would like to retain the CEO and COO hat. Now, if you've got a partner that wants to take on one of those hats, awesome. I do not. Uh, and most of us, I don't think do. But if you do the planning and at the top level and then make it so it is easy to implement, you can do collaboration in the implementation but yeah. the creation usually happens with one person. And I yeah. think that's okay. I think because it's all in your head and you've now put it on the checklist, the operationalization of it can happen throughout the household, but the creation happens with you. Yeah. Yeah. And just like keeping it really simple, you know, I mean, the fact that like my husband now knows, you know, these lists are, they're in this binder and they're, 
in the sheet protector and he knows to grab it out and you grab a dry erase and you mark it off, you know, and if yes. anybody's doing that, a really great tip is the um, uh, magic erasers are really great for wiping those off. <laughs> And starting magic erasers again. are great for almost everything. Everything. It's like if it's not Windex, it's a magic eraser. Yeah. Anyway, those are the <laughs> only two products you need in your entire household. Yeah. Okay. I know we gotta we gotta wrap it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> what do you think you have more of now? Um, more fun. <laughs> like we we're just. I talking love about that answer because fun isn't so overwhelming now. Um, and mm. so yeah, that that even fun can be overwhelming. You know, it takes, it takes yes. work to have fun yes. <laughs> when you're doing things like camping. So yeah, definitely more fun. And, and obviously like more time, more peace, more space. Yeah. And is there anything you wish you'd known sooner? Um, I think I wish I had known things could be simple. You can just make a handwritten list and copy it. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Um, you can stick something in a shoe protector and mark it off with a dry eraser, right? I was always trying to make this like perfect system that had to be so yes. complicated and I'm going to like put it on my computer and it's going to be this thing. And then I have to go update it or it has to be an app. I mean, there's so many apps and that stuff. It's like, honestly, just keeping it super simple makes it easier for my family to use and it makes it easier for me to use. And then the barrier to updating it is very low. So I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to handwrite another list and copy it, right? So um, it just keeping it really, really simple and low tech and paper. Um, and I, I use digital stuff too, but I think we think it has to be so complicated. Um, and it really, really doesn't. So yeah. And if this is like the first podcast episode anyone ever listens to, like what advice would you give to somebody who's just like getting started on their organizing journey? I would say just start slow and keep it simple. Um, and, you know, just going, it sounds weird. And I know listening to, listening to Lisa, the energizer bunny, who has so much energy, I will say, <laughs> you can go slow. Like, and even when, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just do that one thing. And like, just allow yourself to be like, I'm going to noodle in my junk drawer and just slowly yes. throw things away. And I'm, I call it noodling. I'm like, I'm just going to noodle and, and just tidy a little and do things noodle. and organize this. Yeah. Versus like, okay. Cause I want to be like, this yeah. is going to be efficient. Da, 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 da. So I'm like, just, I know it's like overwhelming when you're starting, but um, just pick something small and get, you know, just go slowly if you need to, if it's overwhelming and don't, you just don't need to make it complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Patsy, it has been so nice spending this hour with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, it's been so much fun, Lisa. Thank you so much. <laughs>